I'm always a little concerned when I think about open anything because I have this vague, uneasy feeling that I don't really know what open means. And the more I go around asking people to tell me what they mean when they say open, the more it seems that there is both a consensual hallucination and a collective winking game around openness. In fact, openness in many ways is like the idea of the digital. You can feel it, you can sense it, you can experience it, you live with it and you live through it, and yet it is almost indescribable. It touches you, but it cannot be touched. And it is important, but it cannot be pinned down. This strange characteristic of the open, which is perhaps best seen in how different the definition of open are in, let's say, open education, open source, open access and open government, four of the key sites that I work with, which inspire my thoughts for today. I'm going to try and unpack the notion of the open to pay attention to what we are opening, whose cause is it serving, and what are the longer historical and future-looking implications of building open systems. And I'm going to try and do this through two conceptual confusions, which hopefully will be generative for our discussions. The first proposition I have for us is to think not about the open, but about the closed. One of the strongest Dalit feminist scholars in India, Sharmila Rege, had once mentioned that this entire hype around building open universities confuses her. Because at least in the geopolitics of India, the university was always meant to be an open structure. It was a secular level space where the first affirmative actions were exercised. Universities were designed to be inclusive, supportive, accessible, participatory, with a strong commitment to social and political reform and enshrining the promises of economic mobility that's embedded in the universal right to education in India. In fact, the public university for the longest time worked tirelessly as an institution to accepting gendered, sexual, racial, ethnic and economic minorities, offering them education and learning, a voice and a vocation for over more than six decades now. At the turn of the 21st century, the Indian university was historically changing because for the first time women, people from socioeconomic disadvantages, queer and sexual minorities were all finding visibility. They were not merely being integrated or tolerated, but were actually in positions of power and finding a strong voice to shape the education reform policy in the country. If the universities were achieving this promise for openness, why did we construct them as closed? Who decided that the education there is closed and hence needs to be pride open? Rege proposes that the emergence of these open bodies disestablished and destabilized the elite who were the historical vanguards of knowledge and that the crisis of the closed was not really of the larger population entering formal education but for the select few who found their powers waning. And hence there started a narrative of the university in ruins. The need to create open universities to harness digital technologies, to construct new and relevant forms of learning, which would again become the playground of those who can afford it, leaving the older models for the masses that are now occupying it. It's important to recognize, not as a causality, but as a correlation, that in India, and just like that in many other post-colonial societies, the rhetoric of open education and learning is closely in with tandem with the introduction of private higher education, um, neoliberal public and private policies of quantified learning and creating walled garden experiments which under the pretext of connected learning actually close the possibilities of networking for those who do not have the social, cultural and economic resources to belong to these newly connected learning environments. It leads to a disinvestment of the state from education as a sector. So when we talk about open, Let's not fall into this Disneyfied trap of thinking that it's all well and apolitical and being done for the greater good. It is good, in fact, to perhaps focus on what needs to be described as closed in order for things to be open. And therein will lie our understanding of power and politics in the open. And in some ways, I'm hoping that this mirrors Audrey's ideas of vulnerability where she is looking at how the open agenda produces vulnerability for individuals within the learning system. And I'm kind of building upon it to say that the open agenda, if left unexamined critically, 
also produces new vulnerabilities for structures and bodies which are considered closed. I found Audrey's characterization of trust and quantification as ways by which privacy can be traded off extremely fascinating and challenging in our digitally connected learning environments. If I may extend this argument, I would propose that the basic problem in the connected learning environments that are built out of technologies that structure our surveillance societies um, is that we think of the human as a resource. We are data sets. We are information streams. We are finite and discrete and all of our impulses and desires of learning and communicating are negotiations between convenience and privacy. Thus, the opening of the individual learner in these systems is sometimes a process of reduction. And this is largely because the notion of open is an externalized one. In these kinds of systems of openness, uh, it is something that's attributed to the technological. Digital technologies come and open us up and in the process produce us as vulnerable. The technological formulation of openness thus creates the open as a value that's discrete and separated from the human being. Or if you want to put it into a scientific formula, the human is a closed system. Hence, it is private and personal and unreasonable and not rational. Um, whereas the technological is an open system. Hence, it can render the human as public, as rational, as quantifiable, as open. And it is the role of the digital as it converts memory into storage that it also opens up to negotiations of privacy. Shall I give in to more surveillance, more identification, more tracking so that I can get better visualizations and information sad sets about my own practices and modes of engagement? It doesn't seem very far fetched that there was indeed a school in California that tried to RFID tag their students to track them and to protect them from danger, but also to produce patterns of their behavior which can be used to foster their learning. Whether this trade-off of openness and privacy, especially when it comes to education and learning, is a good thing or a bad thing is a moot point. Because arguing about the trade-off basically makes us think of privacy and openness as a resource, um, as wealth, as property which can be negotiated through. And this is a fundamental problem because it makes us believe that our transactions of privacy and control are only about worth and not value or values. So my second proposition is that we want to move away from these vulnerabilities that Audrey identifies um, as emerging from the dialogue around openness. And in order to do that, we need to reconceptualize the open as a fundamental human value and right. Open is what we are and what we strive to be. Open has to be treated as an inalienable, inseparable right, just the way we treat dignity and freedom rather than be treated as possession and wealth. We need to understand that the open is not a state of negotiation where we give away parts of who we are, but that openness is such a sacred, crucial human state of being that it has to be inviolable. The existing conversations around openness stay focused on what needs to be open, how it needs to be opened, what infrastructure of openness needs to be created, and whether we are open enough or not. This puts the emphasis on questions of transparency, accountability, monitoring, accessibility, visualization, etc. And while these logistic issues are important, they cannot be the central focus of a discussion around the open. It's time to connect the open to not just machine logics, system designs and interface intentions, but to the more human and crucial questions of equality, equity, justice and joy, and see what these do to our understanding of building open and human societies. <laughs>